In three, two. All right, it's time to talk with our featured guest, Lisa Simone Richards. Lisa, how's it going? Oh, it's fantastic. Happy New Year. So excited to be here. I know. What is, let me ask you one thing. I know we're super deep right now at the beginning, but like, what is uh, one thing you wish you said no to more in so, 2022? This is a good question because I've had a second to think about it. I was just listening to your latest episode before we turned on the recording. Um, what do I wish I said no to? Things that didn't value the way that I get to value myself. Um, I'm happy to contribute. I'm happy to do for things for free in the right spaces. But there are some spaces where I could have taken up more space. I could have charged a little bit more. So yeah, I wish I said no to more things that uh, didn't hold the value that I hold myself with. Okay. I like that. I like that. I feel like we can all relate to that. Awesome. So Lisa, if you can, tell us a little bit about your past, your present. How did you get to where you are today? So fun story, back in my first year of university, I was having lunch with a girl who was in fourth year who was about to graduate, and she was telling me that she was going to be going to PR school after. Now, this is 2002. Sex and the City was in its prime, and I don't know how familiar you are with the four main characters from the show, but one of the four, her name is Samantha Jones, she worked in PR. She had her own agency, she worked in fashion and beauty, it was super cool, she went to all these parties, had access to all these exclusive things, and I was like that looks fun. I want to do that. And literally for 20 plus years now, I've been doing PR. So I did get my start in the fashion and beauty industry. I moved over to working into an agency where I worked with clients like Staples, Virgin Mobile, and Crayola. Ended up spending a few years in the fitness space, became a trainer, a boot camp instructor while doing PR for a fitness company. And long story short, around 2015, this is when I noticed that so many people were moving into opening up their own businesses, becoming entrepreneurs, but they couldn't go to agencies like the one that I used to work at because they'd be told, yeah, 100%, we'd love to work with you. It's $10,000 a month. It's a 12-month contract. Just sign here and we'll get started. A lot of businesses didn't have that kind of capital. And it also broke my heart to see people who are really good at what they do not be able to get in front of as many people as possible. So I started my company with the mission of helping small businesses and entrepreneurs actually learn the skills of how to leverage other people's platforms so they could get themselves featured on television, magazines, radio, podcasts, you name it. Nice. Okay. So rewind a little bit real quick and you went full on PR? Like that's oh, what yeah. you did? You went to school for that? So I was an undergrad, you know, just for my general four years, but because in first year I heard about PR, I was like, that sounds cool. And fun fact, at that time, it was harder to get into PR school, which was just a, like a local college than it was to get into med school because so many people were interested in this career now. So I spent four years of undergrad just like volunteering for every organization and group. So I would have a really solid resume by the time I was applying. So I, I went into fourth with like university with intention, and then I spent a year specializing in it. Gotcha. And then just dumb it down for me. PR is what? Public relations, which is all about how do you build a certain reputation for yourself? How do you get visibility for your brand? How do you influence public perception? Gotcha. And this is really interesting. Do you think um, it's easy to start having good PR when you're a brand new business and, and right off the gate, or if you acquired a business and then the business you acquired is like, eh, they had a lot of bad reviews, a bad doctor, all these things. And now it's a new doctor coming in and they feel like they're drowning in it, the previous doctor stuff. I would say it certainly would be easier if you're starting with someone new, but fun story. It's interesting that you mentioned that because the first client I ever had when I started my own business was in 2015 identical twin chiropractors who knew that they both grew up to do the same thing and buy practice together, but they bought a practice from a previous chiropractor and it was all about, okay, they brought me in from the beginning. Like, how do we change our image? How do we make sure people know that it's our name, not his name? How do we start transforming the brand? So um, you can certainly bring someone in to make the shift for you. I've seen that a lot. Okay. Awesome. So then what can a dentist or practice owner do today to improve their, their marketing or their business with this aspect? So one of the things I like to think into is how can you be a newsworthy brand? So many times, like even thinking about your own customer journey process when you're about to buy something, when you are looking and comparing products or services, as soon as you see an as featured on Forbes or as featured on the Washington, the, what do you guys have? The Wall Street Journal. I'm in Canada for the listeners who are like, I don't, she doesn't know the papers. Um you know, when you see logos like that and you see as featured on, you inherently have an immediate feeling of trust 
They're not just letting anybody in those outlets, so they must know what they're talking about. And brands like that can afford to go premium because they have so much backing them that now they're not just like every other Tom, Dick, and Harry. They're the people who have been featured on, you know, Good Morning America. So I think one thing that people can do when they're thinking about getting PR, especially from, you know, medic the medical profession, think about what's newsworthy. So for example, Halloween comes around every year on October 31st. You know what you should be talking about in the media all the first week of November? What do we do to avoid cavities? There's always, a there's always an opportunity to think into what is top of mind for people right now? What is the news cycle already talking about? And how can I insert myself to be a part of the conversation? As we're recording this, it's the beginning of January. We know that New Year's resolutions are all over the place. Perfect time to pitch a newspaper, a television show, whatever it might be. 10 dental resolutions for the year or something along those lines where you can make yourself a part of the story. Yeah. Okay. I have a, like, um, let's do something like, let's just say, all right, how to create a, a straighter, wider smile this new year. Right. And I feel like the ultimate goal for everybody is like, I want to be on TV. Like I want to be on TV talking about it. Right. I'm pretty sure you get that all the time or, or everybody something like wants that. to be on Oprah or Forbes. Those are the first <laughs> two that come for me. Lisa, give me on Oprah talking about the whitest, brightest smile for this. No, you know what I mean? Like they they wanna they wanna do that. How can we start working towards that? If if I wrote down right now, I, I wanna be on, you know what I mean? Like, because I feel like we can write on our own paper and put it on our own blog or website. And then I mean, you know what I mean? Is that really like media uh for it's us putting ourselves out kind of thing? So how can we work up to hey, I'm, I'm on the news or I'm on the local yeah. news, I'm on the TV, yeah. And one of the things you bring up there is really the distinction between um, what I call the distinction between content and visibility. So creating content and putting it on your blog, putting it on your social media, you need to create your own footprint. People are going to creep you before you work with them or before they choose to work with you, sorry. So it is good to have your own content out there. But just like you were saying with a little bit of a mm -hmm on your in your voice, like how many people are visiting the website and the blog? How, many, how much new traffic is coming in there? So we have to make sure we're not confusing content with visibility. Visibility is actually getting in front of new people so they know who you are. And a part of public relations or PR is thinking about, okay, who has a group of my ideal clients all hanging out and how can I leverage that person's platform? So you could write a blog post on your website or what if you looked up your local morning news show, the one that airs on breakfast hours between 6 and 9 a.m. typically, and you sent a pitch to their producer with an idea. Hey, I've got an idea for a, you know, a five minute segment. I know you guys are talking about New Year's resolutions this year. Did you know that 49% of Americans or some random stat like that have cavities? Let's make sure they don't have them this year. I could come on and talk about, listen to me, like literally kicking out a pitch while being interviewed. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, you can say something along the lines of like, I'd love to come on air, talk for five minutes. I'll share the three mistakes to avoid with brushing your teeth this year. And at the end of the segment, your viewers will know how to avoid getting a cavity in the next 365 five days. Like just pitching something like that to a producer could spark an idea for them. Like, oh, that would be an interesting segment for our viewers. And boom, you get a yes. You're on TV in front of your local market. It looks like, oh my God, they selected this person. You went out of your way and asked for it, but that's okay. You ended up on the show. That's the important part. Yeah. I like that. So then how many pitches realistically do we need to be thinking about here to do? So, okay, but I'm going to answer that like in a bit of a roundabout way. Um, I'm a publicist. I do this stuff all day, every day. Uh, for people running dental practices, you're running a business. You can't be in PR all the time. You can't be in accounting all the time. Um, the reality is that producers have, you know, probably around hundreds of emails coming into their inbox every day. So that's why practice dental practices and other practices will hire publicists like me to do the pitching on their behalf. So we can be sending in two, three every single month to stay top of mind until we build a relationship relationship with that, you know, the person we're working with, and then it just becomes easy and they become a recurring guest expert. For somebody who runs their business, they're not hiring a publicist. I would recommend, you know, if you can come up with at least two pitches a month, so you're staying top of mind, the second you get that first yes, and you're on air in front of tens and thousands of local community members, you'll start seeing why this is worth investing your time and money in doing. So two pitches a month to the same person or just like to the same, I mean, the same company or different? Yeah, 
So here's a little beside behind the scenes of how we do it as publicists. So I'm actually going to be working on this for a client today. So I'll build out a media list for them, all the local morning shows, all the local newspapers, all the local, um, you know, city blogs, et cetera. And I'll come up with a list who are the regular producers, what I'll do some research on what area do they cover? You know, if someone's like a hard news producer and they cover like the really heavy hitting stuff, like, you know, wars that are going on, mm -hmm. they're not going to write about a fluffy dental piece. So I'm going to do a little research and be like, you know, who's the right person to reach out to. And typically you're going to find it is consistently the same person for one television show. So I might end up with a list of, you know, maybe 20 people for a city. And those are the people I'm going to go back to over and over again. Um, from my experience, I know depending on the television show, there might be different producers on the same show. And if I never hear something from one of them, or I get notes from that individual, maybe I'll try a different producer and send my ideas to them and see if it lands. So then when should we, I guess, make our blows count somewhere else, like, or, or give up kind of thing where it's like, okay, this has been a year I've been sending, you know what I mean? To ABC news, like they haven't picked up a piece. I think, you need, oh, what would I say to that? I think six months to a year is a good, but you have to be consistent. Like you can't send one pitch a month and be like, oh, it didn't work. Like that's mm. not trying hard enough. But I think six months is a good amount of time to give it a go. Typically something I like to do with clients, we'll do VIP days where we sit and plan out your next 90 days of visibility. So we'll be like, okay, in one day, let's bang out all the topics, all the pitches, what they would be. We can draft them out, schedule them. And then you don't have to think about it until the next quarter. So that's the way that I would approach it. I don't think realistically you're going to take time every other week to do it, but if you could take one day and just focus and build it all out for the next three months, then that's going to be, well, that's going to have a much, much more like much higher likelihood that A, it'll actually happen. And B, since you're actually going to have it happen, you're going to get a success rate. I like that. I like that a lot. So then not once a month, that's not being consistent. So what would you, what would you say is consistent? Like, okay, it's once every week we pitch it or? For someone like me, once a week is makes sense. For someone who runs a practice that doesn't, I would say at least twice a month makes sense. So that way you're having, what, 24 touches in a year? Mm -hmm. And we just send the same thing or like change oh, no, up the we pitch? Change it. Oh, we change it. It's not going to be the same every time. Like, I mean, you can ask for something over and over again. Eventually you get it when it's a no. So um, I would probably pitch an idea, follow up on it maximum two times. And then I'd be like, okay, and taken. It's not a go. Well, let's try a different angle. What else could work? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And there's something you talk about when it comes to the ladder of publicity. Break it down. Yeah. For okay, us a cool. Bit. That's a great question. So when it comes to visibility, I like to bucket into three different ways that people can consume your content. People typically want to watch it or they want to listen to it or they want to read it. And a story that I often tell is my husband and I, we love to cook together. Um, I think we did salmon orzo the other night. It was super delicious, mm -hmm. but we don't do it often enough that I remember how to do it by heart. So every time we do it, I play the video on YouTube and I, I pause it, do what she said, and then I play it again. And I keep doing this throughout the whole process. By the third time I've paused it, my husband's like, I can't stand her accent. I don't want to watch this video again. We've seen it six times. Is there a blog post about this? Uh, At yeah. the end of the day, we both want dinner, but we have different ways of getting there. So mm -hmm. same with our clients. Let's remember they have different ways they like to consume it. So what I recommend is that people should have a healthy media mix. Aim for one written piece one oral piece or audio piece and one visual piece. So no matter how someone likes to consume content, they're able to, to consume what you're putting out there. I like that. That's a really good way to uh, to put it, the cooking dinner and everything like that. Okay. So then do you recommend, how do we work around that? So somebody's listening right now, they're taking notes. They're like, okay, I'm going to do written media, audio, and then visual. Do we send a pitch Let's do one at a time. So again, okay. giving away my secrets here. Um, I don't want to write 30 pitches a day. Like I would rather take one and shop it to a bunch of places and just change a handful of items in it. So typically mm -hmm. I might sit down and go all television. So I don't have to change words like viewers to listeners to readers, like little details like that in my pitch. I want to make my job as easy as possible. So I can just copy, paste, send, copy, paste, send, copy, paste, send. So what I would recommend to people is, you know, do a self-assessment where where do you shine best? Do you do really well on camera in front of people? Or is that your nightmare? Are you an excellent writer? Are you a good conversationalist? Think about where you feel the most confident and start with that one. Because, you know, if I'm trying to get someone who's super shy on television, that's just not going to, they're not going to feel comfortable. It's an uphill battle. Let's just make it easy. So start with your comfort level, the place where you shine, and then you can experiment with different medium from media from there. 
Gotcha. Okay. And I like that. Um, I, Something I, I feel like we haven't really paid attention to that I saw a doctor do was get on a podcast for his community. He was like on it, invited, and it brought him, it wasn't like a local national radio, it was like a podcast. And it, it brought him many things. And I thought, oh man, we have, I've never thought about doing that to get in the community. You know what I mean? Um, now when it comes to like the radio, how does that work? Okay. So here's a fun story that I'm going to share just kind of off the back of the one that you did. So it was something I mentioned earlier is the first clients I had when I opened the doors to my business were identical twin chiropractors. So they have a practice here in Toronto at Young and York Mills, that intersection specifically. Um, their first television appearance was on a show called The Social, which is the equivalent of the American's version of The View. There are four different mm -hmm. hosts. They have guests come in. So they got on national television, everyone from British Columbia on the west side of the province, all the way to the American times on the east side sees these guys on television but guess what only people in toronto who live near yeah york mills are actually going to walk into their practice and that's how they make money they're not selling things virtually it's services so it was really cool to get that national recognition it's really cool to have that logo behind them but when they saw this translate into dollars was when they did local radio or local not local radio local media so it could be you know the local television show that was run by volunteers versus like a huge production crew like it, it was certainly less sexy but it created the result Got you. I feel like, and that kind of leads to another question. So like, let's just say people like the goal, Oprah, right? Like, I mean, I don't even know if that's ever going to happen, but like the goal, right? We're like, let's be on like ABC news or the view, right? Things like that. They do it, they get there, but then what do we do with these things? Like, okay, I'm on TV now. Do I just send a newsletter out to my clients or how do I market? that stuff. So the first thing that I would even start with before we get featured anywhere is get clear on the intention. So yeah. I have something that I call the ABCs of visibility to help people get clear with what is the point of getting visibility in the first place. So are you A, looking to build awareness, make sure, making sure that your ideal clients know that you actually exist. Um, when I worked in the fitness space, I would have so many personal trainers and gym owners say to me, Lisa, I would love to get featured on Oxygen, Strong, Muscle and Fitness, you know, the magazines that they really read and loved. And they would say, I also work with women who are going to the gym for the first time. And I'm like, hey, guess what? Those women are not reading muscle and fitness, oxygen strong. That's not where you need to be to get in front of them. It's where you want to be, but that's not where your client is. So being crystal clear on if I'm trying to build awareness, where's my client paying attention versus what I like to consume? B stands for building a buzz. Um, this is probably going to be a little less so for the bricks and mortar industry, unless maybe you're launching your business and opening for the first time. Um, when a movie comes out, you don't just hear about it once. It's all over the place. There are ads, there are billboards. The actors are on Entertainment Tonight and Access Hollywood. Someone's in a new relationship. Somebody broke up. You're just hearing about it all over the time, all, all the time. So that eventually when you're choosing, hey, what movie should I see? That one comes to mind. So if you're launching a new practice, you might be on a mission to get as many features as possible 30 days leading up to opening so that you have a list of clients who want to come in the day you open your doors. So A is awareness, B is buzz, C is credibility. Are you looking to build your influence, um, to elevate the way that you're perceived, to be able to get into the same rooms as the mentors that you have looked up to? So this is now not about getting in front of an ideal client. It's probably getting that Oprah or Good Morning America, that national presence. It's really cool, but it doesn't necessarily mean dollars in the bank in your business. So being clear on what the purpose of for visibility is the first thing, because, you know, if the guys, the, the twins I mentioned just now, if they got on national television and had no business come in, that kind of wasn't the point. Mm -hmm. So being clear is the first thing I would recommend. Gotcha. So clear on the, your clients, like who do you want to bring in? So let's just say like the, you know, it's mainly practice owners and dentists. So they want to bring in more, obviously new patients. Let's just talk about like Invisalign, right? Want to mm -hmm. have more Invisalign patients or clear aligner patients, straighter teeth. Where do we go from there? When I hear that, you know, I'm thinking about to me when I was 12 years old getting braces, and I know there are a lot of adults getting braces these days too, but think about, you know, what's the demographic I want to get in front of? Is it kids? Then we need to get in front of their parents because the parents are the ones who pay the bills. Like what kind of parenting sites are they going on to? What kind of parenting podcasts for middle schoolers and teenagers are they listening to? Those are some of the places that make might make sense to show up. Local 
local media is 100% going to make sense for brick and mortar practice. Again, national is cool, but if your intention is to have people and to get foot traffic, it's less sexy, but it's it's going to make way more sense to be on the radio than to be on a podcast. Um, we were talking about Invisalign. If it's for adults, maybe is there a piece around like dentistry in the workplace? We talked about sex in the city at the beginning of this show. You probably don't know this, but there was an episode where Miranda, one of the four, got braces and she probably lasted a week with them because she was a partner at a law firm and everyone was like, what? So, you know, maybe reference off of that and turn that into content that you could be pitching somewhere around, you know, how Invisalign is practically invisible. So people aren't going to see it at work. There are so many different angles to be able to play with. Gotcha. And so when we think of these things, we're like we're sitting down, we're thinking of the topics our clients who we want to talk to, who wants to be in front of, right? We're like, okay, this is a boutique uh, ortho location or something where we just want to work with adults. So we want to talk about like what you said, right? Instead of children, or it can be vice versa. We get clear. And then now we start our pitches and we focus on one specific part of the ladder, right? Maybe we're like, okay, we're going to focus on written media. Now, when it comes to written media, I feel like it's great, but then sometimes it's like, you get busy and you're like, oh, I forgot to write. Oh, I forgot to write. And then, you know what I mean? Like it, it, what, what happens there? So here's something really fun with written media in a place where I get to make a little clarification. So when you're reading articles in a magazine, a newspaper, on a blog, a website, those publications actually highly like to be in control of the content. So more likely than not, you're pitching an idea that someone on their team is going to interview you on. They will write the article and they will include your name. Sometimes you can find our opportunities where you're writing the content yourself. But by and large, a lot of the time when I'm pitching for my clients, I'm feeding the journalists ideas. They do the interview. They write the article. My client just gets on a call for like 15, 20 minutes to answer some questions. And then boom, it comes out. Um, so it could go either way. Um, what was the root of that question? I want to come back to it. I just know I want to clear that one part up. No, yeah, definitely. So when it comes to they focus on the written media and then they're saying, okay, I'm going to write and write. They start doing it. They write for a, maybe a, a blog post or a website or whatever, and then they get busy, right? And then they're yeah. like, oh my God, I forgot to write. I forgot. To write. And then they, it feels almost kind of like, not a burden, but like, you're like, oh, I got to keep writing and I got to keep writing. This is why I'm such a big believer in the VIP day model, like to just work with somebody on a day, like, can you make space for four days in an entire calendar year to dedicate to your visibility to not staying the best kept secret? Like, I mean, if you're so full, like awesome, then you don't need to. But if you're looking to grow once a quarter, just take time, map out what the next 90 days look like. If you, once you build a media list, you're pretty much going to have it for a long time. Um, you know, you can just come up with 90 days of content, write those pitches in a day, schedule them. I schedule stuff in Gmail all the time and then let it just do the work because the reality is you're probably not going to make time for it every other week or so. So I think if you can take like one, two days, go intensive on it and then let it sit and do its work for the next 90 days. 90 days, that's where you're going to actually realistically get it done. Gotcha. From your expertise and from like the clients that you have and everything, where would be the best place to start on this ladder? Morning television, hands down. I love morning TV. So when you think about the ladder of visibility or the ladder of publicity, so we had written media at the bottom, audio media in the middle, and visual media at the top. There's a reason visual media is at the top. When people can see you, they can get a sense of your energy, whether or not they like you, um, whether or not they trust you. So you're going to have a far quicker time building that relationship with somebody on camera. Um, I also love morning television because number one, people don't realize how easy it is to get on TV. If you think about the local morning show in your community, so here in Toronto, everyone loves breakfast television. That show is on from five to 9 a.m. Monday through Friday. That's so what is that? Four hours a day, five days a week, 20 hours of content that maybe four producers have to come up with. Do you know how much they appreciate it when someone writes in with a good idea for a segment and they don't need to come up with another segment because they're still doing the social media as well. They're dealing with advert. Well, producers aren't dealing with advertisers. But in any event, if you can come in and give them a great idea and make their day a little bit easier, they will be so grateful and happy for that. So, um, yeah, morning television, hands down the way to go, especially because they have a huge reach, typically in the tens of thousands, if not more. Gotcha. Okay. Morning television then. I, I always thought that the TV show kind of looks at your credibility, but I guess not, right? If you're like just starting out, they're just like, okay, you come on. 
And that's I it. will totally like pat myself on the back and say I'm a rock star getting people their first segment in about 30 days. So what I will say here is don't start with Oprah or Good Morning America, please. And thank you. We just talked about how important it is to go local if you want actual foot traffic. So if that didn't convince you already, if you're going for the big guns, if you're going for Good Morning America, Oprah's not even filmed anymore. Um <laughs> they are going to look at your resume. They're not just putting a random on national television. I've had a handful of people go from never being in the media before to national TV, but start local. When I think about, again, the identical twins, they keep coming up in this conversation. Their first segment was live national television with a studio audience. Mm -hmm. How did that felt if they tripped up? Like, luckily they did a great job. They got asked to come back. They got other segments on other shows out of it. But start small because you're also gaining your footing. You're getting a sense of your messaging, what feels good. And, you know, typically the fifth time you do something, it's always going to be better than the first time you did it. Don't practice on Oprah. Practice somewhere smaller. Get good, then go big. Gotcha. Okay. When do you think it would be, or I guess it's never a good time, right? To just be like, okay, we're good. We don't need to do this anymore. Right. I feel like you're it's in a always position where like your practice is full, you're getting invitations to things, everything's reactive. Hey, by all means, totally chill and coast. But if you're in a position where you want to grow, you want to increase your authority, you want more sales coming in, you want to open another location, you want to make sure your name's getting out there. Gotcha. So then what can people expect from like these results? Let's just say I I, I got a I'm gonna be on TV. I'm gonna be on a podcast local community podcast or radio, right? Mm -hmm. um, from that point on, I mean, like, do people expect like, oh my God, the floodgates are opening you pay? or what, what is it? It's, a, it's an interesting question when it comes to PR, because I always like to say PR doesn't necessarily translate into immediate sales. Like, like I said, with a movie, you're going to hear about it multiple times before you take a touch point to it. But it actually can be different with a service-based physical business. So if this was a client who was launching a product, I might let them know, like, don't think that the a day of you're going to have a bunch of sales. But literally from what I have seen from medical professionals, the day they're on TV, their offices get flooded with calls. The day they're on the radio, the office gets flooded with calls. So that is one, I, I hadn't thought about it until you asked me this question, but that is one industry where I actually do see sales. Well, like I'm not up in their sales business, but they tell me that they're getting immediate sales thanks to that media piece. Gotcha. So it's, it's a lot. It's when you think about PR, it's a long game. It's mm -hmm. not just like, you know, okay, well, I did this once. It should all translate now. Like I didn't go to school for a year and think they owed me a career. I have to go for four years. I have to put it into practice. Like we have to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what was, like, what was the point of me saying that? Um, when it comes to medical practitioners, they actually reap financial monetary rewards pretty quickly. Nice. Faster than other industries, I would say. Okay. I like that. Now, these next questions are just to get into the head of someone who isn't totally involved on the clinical side of dentistry. Cool. So, it's not in there at all. So try me. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So what would you, Lisa, like to see more from a dentist? I think, you know what, I talked to someone the other day who does marketing for homogenous, homogenous industries, like dental practices, like I don't want to say a dime a dozen, but like what makes one different from another. So mm -hmm. seeing more personality, you know, having that personality that hooks people that that's what's going to catch it. Because I feel like I'm sorry to the dentist listening to this, but like probably anyone can fix my cavity. Definitely the service is going to be different. But like when you have a personality and you rely on that personal brand, that's going to connect with people a lot more. And I can't say in Toronto, I can even think of one name who's like the dentist person that we hear about all the time. Like I can think about real estate practitioners who do it, but not in dentistry. Hmm. That's interesting. I like that. What what personality is one that you think like hooks people? You know what? It's not even a personality like traits, but something like, you know, gosh, I feel very hesitant to do drug, do this name drop. And, you know, I don't know the individual personally, but I think about there's a real estate person here in Toronto named Brad Lamb and mm -hmm. his ads are so ridiculous. Like his head floating on a lamb in space or something like that, but it's smart. You know what I mean? Like people know who he is because of his super weird ads. I see one real estate agent has this huge yellow bow that when I'm driving past, I'm like, why is she driving that huge bow? But years later, my husband and I are like, oh, that's Bella. So like, I don't want to say you come up with a gimmick or a shtick, 
but having something that makes you stand out, that makes people remember who you are, people who aren't even looking to have you as a client, that they know who you are, that's going to be huge. I'm not looking for a real estate person, but I know Brad Lamb. I'm not looking for Bella Lee, but I know who she is. So yeah. if you can come up with something that's true to you, I think that's the most important part. Don't manufacture it, but think about who you are and how you come off as a person and what people know you for. How can you make that a part of your personal brand? Because that's going to make you stand out. Gotcha. Okay. I like that. Now we know who Brad Lamb is too. That's interesting. If anyone's awesome. buying real estate in Toronto. <laughs> right now, what do you hate or dislike about dentistry? Man, I'm going to have a hard time answering that because like, I love my dentist. Shout out to Dentistry on the Queue at Queensway and Islington. I've been seeing them for like 10 years. My mom goes there. My husband goes there now. Um, I can't say that there's anything that I hate about it. I wish I had something like constructively critical to share. But I've had really good experiences with all the dentists I've gone to in my life, to be super honest with you. And we're talking like surgeries and braces and stuff. And it's mm -hmm. all been good. That's good. No, that's really fantastic to hear. Okay, awesome. So then what do you love about dentistry? Oh, I don't love the $7,000 quote I got a little while ago. <laughs> um, what do I love? I don't know if so this would is that be right something answer. you dislike about dentistry? The $7,000 like why? Well, I mean, why? I'm not talking about it in Canada because our healthcare is pretty good here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. But why? Why do you feel like um, was it unexpected? Was it too big? Or I mean, obviously it was like a lot, right? But at the it's same time, it's cosmetic like, and it's not necessary. Like I mean, it might become necessary, but I'm like, I'm not paying that out of pocket. Um, mm -hmm. but you asked me what I love. I'll say one thing that I love. I love my hygienist. I love going to see her. She's so. Her name is Lily. She's so exuberant and wonderful. And I, I like look. I always try and book with her, and I get in. And she's just like such a joy to sit with for an hour. So the hygienist. I love my hygienist and I love Dr. H, the owner of the practice. Now I'm just going on about individuals. Yeah, like, no, I guess what it comes down to is like, we were talking about personal branding before, I guess it does come down to the people because the service kind of by and large is relatively the same, but the people who create the experience is the, I guess the winner for me. Yeah. What personality does the hygienist have for you where you're like, we click. She's so cute. Oh my gosh. Well, she started really well. I remember going in for my first appointment with her and she was just like slamming on the compliments. Like, and that you could feel that they were sincere and genuine. She's like, oh my God, your ring, somebody loves you. And I'm like, well, I mean, what woman doesn't want to talk about her engagement ring? And it's like, oh my God, my husband's so cute, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, he's Colombian, I'm Colombian. So like, we just had a good vibe and it made it a lot more fun. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then kind of um, taking an interest, right? Yeah, I guess like, I, I don't know if this is her strategy or just her personality, but just like, you know, giving me a once over when I came in, picking something to hone in on, starting conversation about it, then it's kind of hard because, you know, your mouth's open, they're talking to you, I'm like, I can't yeah. answer back. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get you. No, no, no. And then Dr. H, you said, right? Dr. H, she's the owner. Such what about her? She's wonderful. I know she'll, she doesn't come in for every single appointment, but we'll talk about Sephora, She'll mm -hmm. always ask how my mom's doing. She gives me a hug. Like I tell her my, I'm sending my husband here to look out for him. Like she's just so personable. Okay. And actually, you know what? Let's take it back to that $7,000 invoice they gave me that I still haven't gone for that service on. Um, Even as they were delivering that to me, they're like, so this is going to cost. Dun, dun, dun. The lady who was telling me about it, the receptionist, she was like, oh, my boyfriend and I just got back from this trip and blah, blah, blah. And this is what we're doing next. And like, next time I come in, I'm going to ask you about that. So yeah, every story comes back to the individuals and connection and sharing. Mm, that they're open with you and they talk to you and then they, they it feels more- It's not more... all like stiff and super perfect. Like, I mean, I certainly feel very comfortable. They're incredibly professional. My husband who went there for the first time is like, they're like, I haven't been to such a high tech dentist before, but the, the, pers the, the not too stiff and polished and relatability and personality, that's the, that's the kicker. I have to uh, tell them I talked about them on a podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let them know, let them know. Okay, awesome. So then for the rest of the, or in your own opinion, what needs to change for people to be more open to dentistry? You know what, maybe there's something about the reputation of dentistry as a whole, because you know, the whole people are scared of the dentist. I don't get like, I mean, people have genuine fears. I'm terrified of beats. It doesn't make sense. Um, but like, I don't get why people are scared of the dentist. Like, it's just like, as from kid to teenager to adult, it's always been a good experience. So I've never understood the whole fear of the dentist. And like, for someone, maybe like a kid who's overhearing that, that's their perception before they've ever gone in. So 
how can we rebrand people from being scared of you guys? You're nice. <laughs> You're nice. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like um, that's kind of getting a little bit um, out now. Like the, oh my gosh, the drill, right? I mean, there's a lot of different things. Oh my I God, can... I got it for the first time last visit. That was oh, not yeah. great. <laughs> so were you scared initially going in or no? No, never. Okay. I so had, honestly, I've started my, I think I had my first dental surgery when I was maybe 11 years old. So like, I'm just so used to it. Hmm. So it kind of starts like when you're young, if you're, if you're used to that stuff, then yeah, it's good. But if you're like going now, like as if we're in our forties, thirties, right. You're like, uh, kind of, can we avoid it somehow? You know what I mean? Or I, postpone it? Yeah. I mean, that's me with blood work. I've negotiated not doing blood work with my doctor for 10 years. I'm like, I don't like needles. So yeah. everyone's got their poison, right? That's true. That's true. Okay. I think this um, year she will make me. Yeah. Yeah. Blood work is important. Okay. So then one of the last questions I want to ask you is when it comes to marketing, what stands out to you as a consumer? That's a great question. What's the last thing that hooked me with marketing? I'm thinking about remarketing ads that chase me around. Another thing that's coming to mind, this is such a dated answer, but like a I, this really dates me, but this just honest answer that's coming up right now is a jingle. Like, I know we're not all doing ads and stuff, but like my husband and I even played, this is so silly. We played a jingle game in the car when we were on like a three hour drive the other day, like match the jingle, but like sing different lyrics to it. And like, we were naming stuff from the eighties when we were kids. So little things like that, that just stay with people. Maybe, I mean, this, this advice is coming in 2023. It probably shouldn't be a jingle, but that's it is what stands out for me. So it's more like um, a jingle. So it's like what they hear, right? Because people can, it, it's so interesting. Like you think about like even patients suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's, like they hear a chord of a song and it brings something back for them. So just even thinking that psychologically, like how can we really get ourselves in the brains of a person beyond like, we do great smiles. Like, yeah. How do you think then we can really get into the brains of someone? Something memorable, something unexpected. Like even as I think about, you know, if I'm not well versed in Facebook advertising by any means, but one thing I learned from an ad person that I worked with is, you know, you should never do an ad in blue. It should be red. It should interrupt the feed. It should stand out. So again, something that inter some sort of pattern interrupt, something that stands out, something that people don't expect at all. Even as I think from um, a PR point of view, and we're, again, we're having this conversation in the new year. My One of my most successful pitches for a fitness company was about why you should break up with your gym in the new year when everybody is talking about going to the gym in the new year. So if you can do something unexpected and zig where everybody else zags, that's what's going to make you stand out. I like that. Also, I was going to ask you, like, how do how can we do that in our PR? So when it comes to like, you can put your mindset in like the practice owner, the dentist, right? How can they do that when it comes to reaching out, pitching. Flip a script. Like, here's why you shouldn't floss this year. Okay. I'm sure you have a real reason behind it in the story. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, I remember the reason we pitched breaking up with your gym, this you, why you should break up your with your gym in January is because at the time around 2011, when we did that, gyms only had 12 month contracts. Like there wasn't Peloton and Soul Cycle in one month, like you signed and you were there for a year and our boot camps were all eight or 12 weeks. So we were like, yeah, you should break up with your gym in January, flirt, try different things. Like our boot camp, it's only eight or 12 weeks. Like, you know what I mean? There was a yeah. purpose behind why we were saying to do something to zig when everyone else sagged. But yeah, if you could talk about, here's why you shouldn't floss this year. And then you're promoting like an electric flosser or something like yeah, that. Like a water pick or something. Oh, like that's that's yeah. the word I was going for, a water pick, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. When you said that, I was like, oh yeah, water, that, that would be really good. But if we're trying to get them to the practice, we have to think of like, uh, something in that area, but I like that. Why you shouldn't floss this year or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, in the PR world. Awesome. Yeah. A game that I, I think a game that makes it a little bit easier for people when they're trying to think of what's an idea I could come up with. Um, a lot of the time, if I'm standing in line at the grocery, for those of you who still go to the grocery store and you're not just ordering it online, um, when you're standing waiting to check out, so again, I guess if you're not at self-checkout either, really dating myself, um, when you're waiting to check out with a the cashier, they have the magazines at the front, and those are some of the best copywriters in the world. They have a few, like a minute maybe, to convince you to buy a $7 shiny piece of paper that will be irrelevant next week. So look at what are the headlines they have there, and think about how could I swap out two or three words to make this relevant to me and what I do. I like it might that. be something like, you know, the top 10 ways to get fit in 2023. 
the top 10 ways to have pearly white. You know what I mean? Just like play and swap out a few words because those are the headlines that are working. That's why they're on the cover of newspapers and magazines. So if you can like swap out a few words and make it your own, that's actually going to help you come up with some creative ideas. And then you can build out this pitch from there. Yeah, I like that. Actually, that's a, since oral health, you know, leads to a lot of the rest of the body, you can eat, combine the two and kind of say like, why uh, your oral health is not allowing you to lose weight or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because of the both of the two. And great ideas, Lisa. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure. But if our listeners wanted to reach out to you, where can they find you? Yeah, 100%. If you want to learn more about me, you can visit me at publicityfordoctors.com. And when you visit me at publicityfordoctors.com, I have a free download there for you called The Doctor's Guide to Getting on TV. So I'm going to send you a PDF and it has, I believe, it's a checklist of five things to help you get on local television. So we spent a lot of time today talking about how morning television is one of the best avenues to get publicity. Head to publicityfordoctors.com to get my free checklist. Awesome. So guys, that's all going to be in the show notes below. So definitely go check that out. And Lisa, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a pleasure and we'll hear from you soon. Thank you so much, Michael.